Last month, a rock musician's fiance became the first person in the UK to receive the COVID vaccine damage payment of £120,000 after her 48-year-old partner died, sadly, from a blood clot following the AstraZeneca jab last year. Our guest today, Sir Christopher Chope, who's a member of Parliament for Christchurch in Dorset, has been fighting for fundamental reform of the vaccine damage bill. He has called upon the Secretary of State to establish an independent review of the disablement and injuries caused by the COVID-19 vaccinations and to assess the adequacy of the compensation offered to those who have suffered severe consequences or worse. Now only time will tell what will happen to the bill given that Boris has resigned today and that the Conservatives Party now in disarray uh, it's unclear how this will move forward. Nonetheless, it's absolutely clear that the government are anticipating hundreds of thousands of cases to be reported, and this problem simply won't go away, and it's unfortunately likely to worsen over time. During the course of this interview, we discuss a number of key points, including the role of the government and the MHRA in failing to address vaccine injuries. We address why there's such a reluctance for the government to promote the availability of the vaccine damage scheme. We hear some of the devastating stories of the victims of the vaccine injuries and how they've been treated by uh, the, the healthcare and political systems. And we address whether the current uh, vaccine damage scheme is adequate uh, for, uh, or fit for purpose. And finally, we explore the challenges that Sir Christopher Chope has faced in reaching some of these issues. Now, whilst I'm incredibly supportive for the courageous work that Sir Christopher Chope has undertaken with this bill, uh, in reflection of the wider conversation with their interview, there's some things that I would have gone back and challenged him on. You will note that despite the vast uh, damages and even deaths that he has witnessed and that we discussed within this interview, like many other politicians, he continues to refer to the idea of getting vaccinated as doing the right thing. Now, whilst this was evidently part of the party line, so to speak, during the mass vaccination rollout, to me, this references a deeper cultural problem surrounding the vaccines. If you remember, Kate Bingham, who was the chair of the Vaccine Task Force, originally stated that the vaccines would be simply for the most vulnerable adults. But since then, so much has changed. And we've witnessed the whole manner of coercive practices that has led people to take the vaccine under circumstances where they would not normally make such a decision. Now, this is quite clearly a controversial subject, and we're expecting censorship across our channels as a result of airing this. However, it's really important that we continue to get the word out about these issues and to support the likes of Sir Christopher Chope, who are battling hard to ensure that the those who have suffered harms get the compensation that they deserve. If you'd like to find out more about how to support campaigns and initiatives like this, then I encourage you to join the Elevate Network, where we're exploring how to support projects like this. So head over to weareelevate.org and join our private community, where we're hoping to make a difference in the world around us. For now, enjoy this interview with Sir Christopher Chope. This is a big one and there's lots more to say on this subject. Mm -hmm. Greetings Sir Christopher Chope, it's great to have you with us here today on the Elevate podcast. Welcome uh, to, to this conversation today. Well thank you for inviting me along, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure. So firstly um, we're here to talk about the vaccine damage bill that you've been uh, driving forward. Could could you start by just letting us uh, give some insight into what led you to taking on this task, um, this 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 uh, heavy task? It seems. Well, it's turned out to be a lot heavier than I expected. <laughs> I must say, um, basically, uh, about a year ago, it came to my knowledge that there were a large number of people who had had adverse reactions to the vaccines and some of, in some cases had actually died. Um, and so I started looking into this issue of uh, what, what do we do to help such people, uh, particularly in the context of the issue of vaccine confidence. And I discovered that as an initiative to try and promote vaccine confidence, the government had extended the COVID-19 vaccine program into the uh, legislation which covers vaccine damage so that there is, a, there is already a legislation on the statute book in the United Kingdom uh, which enables people who uh, suffer damage as a result of, of vaccines to be able to receive uh, payments. 
and has, it's not called compensation, but it's a vaccine damage payments scheme. So the government having extended that scheme to cover the COVID-19 vaccines, um, I thought, well, as night follows day, then it's going to be quite routine to be able to refer people who have suffered uh, to this uh, scheme. Um, and then I got involved in thinking about what sort of schemes are in place in other countries. And there was an interesting uh, seminar being conducted by, I think, the Institute of International Comparative Law uh, on what different si systems for compensation there are in other parts of the, the world. And the relevance of having a robust compensation scheme uh, in, in the context of uh, vaccine uh, security and people wanting to vaccine confidence because people were encouraged, you know, and, and I'm not against this, people were encouraged to take the vaccines, um, and uh, but they were told that in that small minority of cases where the vaccines uh, don't have the desired effect, uh, then there would be a uh, recompense for those who suffered adversely because they'd tried to do the right thing for themselves their family and their country and uh, they'd suffered um, adverse uh, consequences and that was i think the the, the deal in a sense uh, between the the government and and the people and i thought that that was going to apply um in 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 this case but ever since i started taking an interest in it i've encountered a reluctance on the part of both the government and um, other media outlets, and indeed the, the uh, large segments of the population itself, to face up to the reality that for some people these vaccines have caused uh, either death or, se or serious injury. Uh, and there seems to be a sort of a state of denial. The, the government's been in denial about this. And so I then started inquiring about the, the, the scheme and discovered uh, that the government really hadn't done much to deal with and wasn't doing much to deal with people who had applied under this, uh, this scheme. And we've now got a situation where some people have applied for putting their applications over a year ago. And we are only just beginning to see um, the first uh, cases uh, being uh, decided. And the there was a... I asked lots of parliamentary questions. I had a, uh, I, I chose to put down a private member's bill, which was debated briefly in September last year. That, in a sense, opened my eyes to the problem that we had because um, that the, the, the discussion, the debate on that in the House of Commons was uh, taken down by um, the media organisations when people tried to spread the word that I was doing something on this issue. Uh, and if, from then on, it's, uh, it hasn't quite taken over my whole life, but it's become an increasing focus of my parliamentary activities uh, because I can see that there's something seriously wrong here which needs to be remedied and that um, there are very few privileges uh, of being uh, uh, greater than being a member of parliament and being able to ask questions direct of the, of the, the government about what's happening on behalf of, of people who are affected. And, and that's that's really the, the background to it. And um, this year, um, with a new session of parliament, um, I put down a, a two or three private members bills relating to this subject. Uh, the first of them, uh, similar to the one I had, had, had last year, it is due to be debated on the uh, 16th of September, but that's it's fourth in the list, and whether it gets debated or not is dependent upon what happens to the bills earlier in the order. But it's a vehicle uh, to enable me to continue uh, this campaign and get other people in, in, engaged in it, and an increasing number of parliamentary colleagues are now beginning to uh, take, take notes. So I'm, I'm encouraged by, by that. And meanwhile, um, we have been able to uh, persuade the, the government that the new terms of reference for the uh, COVID-19 inquiry were announced uh, by the Prime Minister yesterday. And uh, we made, or I made, and, and others did as well, representations that this issue of um, the 
vaccine damage should be included within the terms of reference and it now is going to be so that's that's um some progress on that front and and as i've referred to we've, we've now got the first uh findings of um uh, the causation um that established between uh, the taking of the covid19 vaccines and um serious injury or death resulting therefrom and leading to the, the fixed uh, 120,000 pound a payout from the government. Thank you. I mean, your opening gambit here has raised a number of issues to explore. I mean, I mean firstly, in terms of the challenges and raising these issues, the reality is, and I know you, your your um, your your speech was famously um, retracted from social platforms, um, and even in us using the official term for a parliamentary bill. In, in the context of an online broadcast, saying the term vaccine damage in, a, in, a, in an interview can lead to a piece of content being removed, which, which for me illustrates one of the great, great challenges in actually raising awareness of these issues, not, not least from the perspective of the actual practicalities that you've outlined in terms of making this accessible to people, but actually for those who have suffered, who, are, who have yet to become informed that there is a... Um, there is a payment available to them if they have suffered. Uh, and to hear that people have been waiting for over a year, quite frankly, if pe given that the, 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 the payment scheme is for people who have been severely disabled or, or, or have, have faced loss of life, you can, you can anticipate that there's going to be a reasonable loss of earnings. Uh, and that's let, let alone the psychological uh, grief, trauma that's come from the actual injury or, or, or loss of loved one. Um, so to me, this is a, a vital importance of work that you're doing because people have really, these are human beings that have, you know, they've, they've, they've followed the government instructions that they were given willingly and now, and now they're suffering. What, what has been your, what has been the nature of your conversation with some of the victims? How, how, how has this been received by those that have suffered? I think mo most most of the people to whom I've I've spoken, um, mainly um, online rather than it, than in in person, face to face, m most of them um, have experienced um, a feeling of isolation that the government doesn't want to know. Uh, quite often, um, when they've discussed these issues with their GPs or other elements in the health service, as they have uh, been are almost treated as though they've got a mental disorder uh, and that it's uh, something that's in their mind rather than in the, the reality. And so that has added to the pressure upon the people who've, whose lives have been transformed. Um, people took the vaccine and then a few days or weeks later, they suffered uh, the, the consequences of the adverse reactions and um, it's no exaggeration to say that there are unfortunately thousands of people for whom life is never going to be the same again as a result of having done the right thing and taken the, 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 the vaccine. And um, so my, my, one of my bills for this year is, is not just to deal with the issue of uh, compensation and redress, but also to deal, to try and get the health service to take the plight of those who have suffered as a result of the vaccines, taking it seriously, because the health service are quite prepared to accept that there are people suffering from long COVID as a result of having COVID, but they're not prepared to accept that there are a whole lot of people who are suffering a, a, a different range of uh, problems as a result of having had vaccines which have created an adverse reaction in their immune system. So um, there's the whole issue there. And we know that there are lots of people who've been occupying hospital beds as a direct result of having had the, the, the vaccine and, and the consequences flowing directly from that. But the health service seems to be in denial. And that goes back to the whole issue of the, the government wanted everybody to get vaccinated. Uh, and so they started off saying that the, these vaccines were absolutely safe. And now they've changed their tune and have accepted that they are for most people um, safe, but for a few people, uh, they are not uh, safe. But again, it can't get uh, open admissions by the government on this. And most recently I asked the 
health secretary in a an oral question about two or three weeks ago, I, I, I asked him to accept that asked him whether he accepted uh, that some people have died as a direct result of having COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, and I thought the answer would be a straightforward yes, because obviously that's been the decision in coroner's courts. And indeed, it's now been uh, the decision in a few of the cases for compensation which have been decided. Uh, but the, the Secretary of State couldn't bring himself to answer that case, that question um, in the straight affirmative and say, yes, I recognise that. He said that he realised that the, the vaccines have been fantastically good news for um, almost everybody. But for some people, he said, it, the vaccination hadn't produced the desired outcome. Well, I'm talking about uh, using words which um, are, are designed to try and present a very different picture to the reality. I mean, I just, I, I found that very depressing in itself. So, but he, again, in that uh, answer, he did say that he would um, have another discussion with me about these issues. And I'm looking forward to having another meeting with him. I've already met him once to discuss this. And I've met uh, the vaccines uh, minister on, on two occasions. So um, hopefully now that we've got confirmation uh, that the, a government organisation um, which is dealing with these claims uh, now accepts that uh, there have been people who have uh, suffered death or serious injury, uh, that the government will uh, stop denying all this and will come and um, be much more open and transparent. But it's jolly difficult trying to get the data out of, out of, out of the government. Mm, I mean, I think the type of response that you've outlined there from the health secretary is, is what's led to a number of um, people who have suffered feeling like they've been gaslit. You know, that's the term I've heard a number of times. They don't feel like they've been taken seriously um, from the medical professionals, let alone the politicians. But I've actually spoken to a number of GPs on this issue. And to be quite frank, they're at a loss. Uh, a lot of them I've spoken to just don't know how to deal with these situations um, themselves. They haven't got the training to actually, even though some of the symptoms are pre presenting themselves as, you know, more, more uh, known illnesses, it's the it's the correlation or potential causation in in in, in association with the vaccines that they are struggling with. Uh, that, you know, they 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 they've they've heard a message as as all of us have through the government that these things are safe and effective, and that's been the general rhetoric. But it's it's it feels like it's created a barrier to actually addressing these real harms, um, both in terms of a practical sense of actually receiving treatment, as you've outlined, but also from the transparency of conversation. Um, and, and you can understand, you know, within I can understand the motives of the government. I do understand their their prerogatives, but my personal sense is the denial, the lack of transparency, is causing. And again, from another GP I've spoken to in the last week, um, it's causing a huge lack lack of trust or loss of trust in vaccines. Vaccine confidence is is deteriorating as a result, which many of the psychologists who commented on the the approach that the government was using to uh, quote unquote, encourage people to take the vaccine would actually lead to a, an erosion of confidence. What's what's your sense on the impact that what you've witnessed will have upon vaccine confidence going forward? Well, I, I think I think the, the 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 government, as you as you say, the, the government's denial uh, uh, that basically vaccines could cause uh, harm to those who took them, even in a small minority of cases, uh, when. Everybody knows you know, the, the anecdotal evidence and people talking to other people who've, whose lives have been transformed as a result of taking the, the, the vaccines. What we're seeing now is people are losing trust in, 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 in the government. And that's what happens. And that's why some other jurisdictions have been much uh, more open in providing compensation for those people who've done the right thing and taken the vaccines because they realize that that's one way of uh, creating a, a, a climate of, of confidence in, in, in the government, recognising, if the government recognises that for some people, the, taking these vaccines is going to be uh, have disastrous co consequences. Uh, the, the, the denial of the government, it, it, uh, coupled with the anecdotal evidence to which you, you're referring and, and people, people's own experiences, is resulting in reduced take-up. Uh, and so we're seeing a declining number of people taking uh, the, the the boosters, and um, 
there's there's some suggestion that this may now be uh, spreading into other territory in relation to other other vaccines. That is very undesirable from my perspective, from the from the public public health point of view. But that is what happens when people lose trust in in the in in the the, the, the government or in the health service or in in their their GPs and the 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 medical side of this um, and the scientific side is is extremely complex because we're talking about uh, interfering with people's immune systems by giving them uh, vaccines and um, so this this has resulted in, in all sorts of complications and I've spoken to people who spent weeks in hospital um, actually where they've been trying to they have every test under the sun to try and ascertain what it is that is the cause of the condition that they've got and uh, often at the end of you know, two or three weeks of exhaustive uh, tests the conclusion is uh, 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 uncertain because it, it, all, all that they, people can see is that there's no underlying cause for what has happened other than the fact that you were vaccinated uh, and this is um, causing a lot, lots, of, lots of medics to uh, scratch their heads and indeed and we, as we know there are, there are some medics uh, one particular case I'm thinking of of, of a, a young, a young uh, physician who volunteered very early on to, to have the vaccine because uh, he needed it. He thought he needed that to, to protect himself at work, and he suffered uh, and, and and died. And uh, yet, uh, his inquest has not yet been uh, concluded. And because he was working for the health service, I would have expected the health service to have done everything possible uh, for his his family and all the rest of it uh, to. Um, console them and and to express support for him having done uh, the right thing by his his profession and and having suffered these consequences but not a bit of it and i'm afraid that it's that aspect of it which makes people feel that the, the, the there's a part of the health service which can be rather callous uh, when dealing with cases which don't uh, fit uh, the, their their agenda Mm, I, I think this is you've re again. This raises a number of complicated issues because this whole idea of these conditions emerging, where there's and I, again, I've, I've spoken to a consultant surgeon in uh, a local hospital here. I won't uh, name which hospital because it would probably lead you to find out who he is. But um, he dealt with eight individual cases of blood clots within um, middle-aged women um, within one evening. Um, uh, during the rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And he himself did his usual um, inspections to uh, 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 ascertain whether there is any of the usual causative factors that would lead to blood clots within these women. And the, the, the normal uh, functions that would lead to these types of clots were not present. So, you know, he'd been double vaccinated himself. He had no, no um, history of... Um, challenging vaccine safety but for him there was a clear warning sign and that was shortly before um the pre press conference was held around the link with blood clots and uh, astrazeneca but we've seen many stories like this um where we're seeing these presentations of illnesses within close proximity of the vaccines and again it comes almost to denial that the, there is an association and now i do understand the, the challenges of proving correlation or causation. I, I understand all of that. But given the sheer volumes of these cases, um, surely we can start to deduce that there is a possible association at the very least. Well, we can. And, and indeed, that's uh, the, the, the government and even the um, medicine and health care regulatory authority are, are, are accepting that in some cases, they're, they're that they, there is uh, causation is, is direct causation is is likely and indeed that's um, what must have been established um, in these cases where, where we've had the first uh, payouts. But having said that, that the government is it, it is still very. I, mean, I keep putting down parliamentary questions about this, and it is still very difficult to get uh, open disclosure of the the facts. 
and uh, the MHRA and the Joint Committee for uh, Vaccines, the JCVI, um, they um, are just not being as open and transparent as I think is necessary. Uh, and um, why why is it stuff? Be, why is there any need uh, to uh, cover cover this up? We've we've most people have now been uh, vaccinated. Um, and what we need to do now is to make sure that th those for whom the, the consequences have been um, unsatisfactory, that they get uh, properly looked after. And preferably, now most of these people don't want compensation so much as to be able to put right, be put right to where they were before. And that's, that's very, very difficult. Uh, and um, so now, all, all I can say is that, that um, this is a, a fight that's continuing in, in, in Parliament and, and it gives me and my colleagues great encouragement to know that uh, we are speaking not just for a handful of our constituents, but for a large number of people across the country. Yes. Well, on that point, I suppose, do, looking at the, the, the means at which we capture these injuries, do you think the yellow card system and the other methods of capturing the harms is adequate? Well, it's the it's the it's the best that's available, um, and the yellow card system has been the traditional way in which um, adverse reactions to vaccines have been measured. But what is of concern to me, and I know to many other people as well, is that the the rules seem to have changed and the status of the yellow card system, because the yellow card system used to be regarded by the government as being um, very useful evidence uh, as to what was happening. Uh, but now the government um, seems to be taking the view, well, uh, all it is is a whole lot of people sending in some uh, self-diagnosed uh, issues um, and we, it doesn't prove anything and, and so on. If that's correct, then why are these the results being analysed and the analysis being given back to the pharmaceutical companies, but not being shared uh, with with the people? One asks, uh, and so there's a whole host of issues around uh, that. And uh, questions again, I've asked of the government. Um, I, I've asked them, well, what have uh, the the inquest sometimes going into uh, lasting several days with lots of medical evidence inquests where the the coroner and and the, uh, has decided that the cause of death was a uh, COVID nineteen the vaccine I've said well what is what's the government what conclusions is the government drawing from that and and all I got my last question on that was well um, these matters are drawn to the attention of the MHRA. And what does and, and then the question arises: What does the MHRA do with this information? And that's where there's a there's a, a big uh, cover up, uh, and that's uh, all just adds to the suspicion uh, that uh, all is not uh, well, and that there's a reluctance to share um, those issues with the general public. Mm. Have you ever faced anything like this? And you, you, you know, you've had a long, distinguished career in politics. Have you ever faced anything like this before? No, I, frankly, I, ha I, ha I haven't. I mean, I, I, I've, um, I, I felt uh, you know, that, that quite often um, governments and bureaucracies are too keen to uh, cover up because they think that's the the, the, be the best way of of dealing with an embarrassing uh, issue. Uh, but um, in this case, we've got uh, the, the government on the one hand saying we, it's committed to promoting public health um, uh, of the population, whilst at the same time denying um, the necessary information to enable people to be informed about those public health uh, issues. And so it is an extraordinary sort of anomaly, really, a contradiction uh, that, that the government um, is, not, is not willing to be more, more open on these issues. Yes. Well, the, you mentioned that some of the first payouts have been made, and that's correct. That, 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 you know, I, that I've read of two individuals now who have received £120,000, but both of them were, were where they've lost loved ones. Uh, so, uh, you know, more than disablement, actually death. 
do, do you think one hundred twenty thousand pounds is is adequate payment or redress for such loss? Well, it's it's obviously uh, not. It's, it's an arbitrary figure. Um, every single person whose claim is uh, successful will get one hundred twenty thousand pounds, irrespective of the nature of the injuries or loss that they've they've suffered irrespective of their age irrespective of how long it's going to take them uh, to need care irrespective of the effect on their employment or employability and so in that respect it's it is um, arbitrary and it's not a compensation scheme it's it's just a a payout um, it, it is it's obviously not uh, adequate it's not uh, flexible enough um, uh, well, not flexible at all. And it's also a sum which hasn't been increased um, since, I think, 2014. So um, it, that sum itself, if it had gone up in line with inflation, would be near uh, between 175 and 180,000 uh, pounds. And again, the, the minister has expressed sympathy for my uh, asking questions about why, why can't we put it back to where it was? Um, but again, no action on the part of the government. There again, in a sense, um, sh showing a lack of um, concern to, to those who've been adversely affected. Why, why not increase the, 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 these payouts in, in line with inflation? But there's, a, there's much more fundamental reform that needs to be carried out. And that's what my bill is designed to try and uh, force the government to do. Um, but uh, we're we're a long a long way away from from that. But you're you're right. A a, a one off payout for somebody who's who's died is 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 some something. But for somebody who has uh, suffered um, life changing injuries, which they're going to be uh, living with the consequences of for forty or fifty years um, and need carers, um, that that sort of one hundred twenty thousand pounds is nothing. It's very complicated. I mean, I've had personal experience in a different context with these types of injury schemes. My wife's mother um, died of mesothelioma, uh, mesothelioma, which is a rare yeah. form of cancer caused by asbestos. Um, and we, the burden was placed upon the family to try and find the root cause of where she may have picked yeah. up this asbestos. And there was, there was, there was a, a re, uh, her her partner had worked for a company where by asbestos had been verified to be used, and there was multiple cases of cancer. But we could never prove direct causation, and she never received the compensation. But she later lost her life as a result of that. And I, I had a sense that people are going through similar battles now to prove to prove to prove the harms from what we've discussed. Um, but now that those first payments have been made, do you think more people will now come forward? Do you think that's going to give people hope uh, and actually to, to, to register for these payment schemes? Um, I, I, I hope so. Uh, and, and I hope that, and I, again, I hope that the government um, will be more open in, in the, these outcomes because I, again, asked the question as to um, how many uh, cases have now been resolved and I, and I think I, I got the answer that there have been seven or nine, or nine at, the, at the last count but they weren't prepared to tell me how many have been successful and how many have been unsuccessful mm -hmm. um, because they said that that might um, enable people's identity to be disclosed. Well that's, that's a load of, load of tosh frankly uh, because um, we weren't talking about the identity of people and so again, the, the government doesn't seem to want to promote the availability of this scheme because it's going to lead to even more cases. But the, the government is now expecting um, uh, a hun hundreds of uh, no, thousands, tens of thousands of cases to, to be um, ap applications to be be made, and they've they've now at least got an organisation set up trying to uh, deal with these. But even then, you can't start your claim until you've got the medical notes that have been supplied by your medical practitioner. And despite this be those notes normally being held by the NHS, uh, there's there are delays being experienced in the NHS supplying the notes for the patients who have applied 
uh, under the vaccine damage payment scheme. And um, the government has given these, um, an, 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 it gives incentive payments for um, GPs and others to provide the notes. But those incentive payments are not linked into a time scale. So notes are not coming forward quickly enough. And that, again, is producing delays within the, the system. And when you ask questions about that, again, um, you instead of getting the transparent answer, you get basically, basically the cover-up. So even the health service is not giving the priority it should be to ensuring that the notes for patients who adversely suffered from the vaccines are provided to the organization which is looking at these claims my goodness i mean uh, this is this this is shocking to hear um uh, well related to this piece i'd like to explore the the actual um definition of vaccine damage is it too narrow because this concept of disablement i actually did a bit of research into the origins of where this comes from and actually the, i don't know if you'd concur with this but it seems that the 60 percent disabled rule was borrowed from old arcane compensation schemes that were used within industrial accidents, such as, you know, uh, crush injuries in mines and manufacturing, where, of course, there is a much higher risk of actual physical disablement. But but how do you apply this to a, an autoimmune reaction that might not result in a loss of limb or, or, or a physical manifestation? It might cause long-term fatigue, brain fog, or other psychological or physical manifestations that are not quantified as disablement. Do, do you think this scheme is far too narrow? Well, it, it, it is It is far too narrow. Uh, and um, actually, under the original scheme, the level of disablement was even higher than 60%. Um, so that, that, was, that was reduced down to, to 60%. Uh, but it, 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 it does have its origins in the, the a proxy for the industrial injuries benefit scheme and is wholly inappropriate to the sorts of um, autoimmune reactions to which you're, you're referring. That's, that's why I don't think we should have a 60% thing. It should be, if, you're, if your life has been altered uh, you know, significantly um, as a result of having the, these uh, vaccines, uh, then the, there should be um, ac access to um, re redress. Uh, and the... This, is, this could be complicated for the, for the, for the government, but I, th I think they need to do something about this. And um, the, the, the problem is when you see the, what's happening with um, the, the contaminated blood inquiry, for, for, for example, years and years and years later, um, people start getting access to compensation. And, 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 but we, we need timely responses now um, and, and we're, we're not we're not getting that. I'm, af I'm afraid. Uh, how the, how then do you tackle emergent conditions? Because obviously, as we mentioned, we're, we're relatively early on, and if there's uh, we've seen it historically with other vaccines, there's been uh, incidents, in, injuries, and adverse reactions that have taken time to manifest. Um, but similarly, you know, there's new studies coming forward on on some of the impacts of the vaccine on the on the uh, immune system uh, with regards to fertility. There's a, 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 a a, a paper that's just come out from Israel, which is uh, peer, peer review, which, which has shown some early indication of reduction in sperm count. Again, in the context of speaking on a social media platform, I'm not stating that this is a concrete fact, but this is a, a an early signal. If, if these signals continue to operate or, or, or come, uh, there's new distinctions that are made. How then do you how do you start to capture these over the lifetime of the long tail of a vaccine? Well, it's going to be it's going to be very 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 difficult, and and obviously one thinks about things like thalidomide, um, and um, the 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 long term consequences, and we still um, that that's all in in the the unknown factors, um, and, and that's and I I think that if the government and and the authorities and the pharmaceutical companies were more open about um, some of these issues then it it would it would help Im immensely but i i i think that we're looking at a, and we we could be having this a similar conversation in this in 10 years time uh with a whole lot of people probably now a lot more people 
um, saying, well, I, 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 my life's been changed. And why was it changed? It was changed because um, I, I did the right thing and took the vaccine. Well, on that last, on this last point, then, in terms of the future, what changes would you like to see made? Because I think this is important. What can we learn from this, and how can we ensure this it, it never happens again? What What would be an ideal outcome? And I suppose to even give further context, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that you'd done some research around practices around the world. Is is there is there a have you come across a more suitable model that could be applied here? I. I, th I think I, I, I have, but I'm, do I'm still doing, do doing work on that. But I, I think the, the, the schemes which are centred around um, no fault are, are the, the best ones, um, where if there is no other reasonable explanation for somebody's condition or changing condition other than the vaccine, then that in itself should be evidence of uh, sufficient evidence to uh, trigger a compensation or re or redress, and um, because that's because we're talking about uh, lots of unknowns here and very hard to to prove in the same way as you were talking about mesothelioma. Uh, that 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 I think would be one one transformation which could be made. Another transformation would be uh, to have a lot more flexibility in the system of of payouts, but. I also don't want to lose track of the, the, the really important issue that the, the National Health Service should be pulling out all the stops to try and help the people who are suffering and get their health as far as possible back to what it was before. And that seems to be a big black hole in, in, the, in what's happening in the health service at the moment. And there are, for all the people who are uh, over 60% disabled as a result, there are you know, th thousands more who are, are suffering really um, damaging, um, life-changing consequences uh, for which they, they, they're not looking for financial compensation. They're actually looking for the health service to get them well well I, I i try to remain stoic within these conversations but i'll confess i felt a combination of rage anger sadness um during this conversation um but actually real admiration for the courage and tenacity that you've demonstrated to take this this cause on when so few have been willing to do so and i know you face challenges in in, in drumming up support along the way i suppose I'd like to close up by really speaking into that courage, honour and valour. To me, these are characteristics that I would like to see more of in politics. Um, full stop. Um, you know, what, 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 what can we do to, to enter into a new epoch of politics that is driven by open transparency, uh, courage, honour, integrity? You know, some of these characteristics that you've demonstrated what, what can we do to drive more of this within politics? Because to me, it feels like it's it's abundantly absent. Well, I, I think you're very generous with your with your comments, but this is not a personal issue. This is, I, I think, actually, when you um, lift the the veil from a lots of politicians collectively who who may be regarded as being you know, regarded as rogues and all the rest of them, just in it for themselves. But if you actually look at individual members of parliament you'll find that in almost all of them there is a desire to actually help individuals in their constituency and that is what drives them forward which is why i encourage any, everybody who writes to me who's from outside my constituency to contact their own mp and get that mp to I engage in, in in their issues and you now by and large, that's what happens. Uh, and so I, I, I wouldn't um, suggest that um, it's unusual for people to be um, sticking up for this. But I think the, the, bigger, the bigger problem is the other side of the equation, which is the, the um, impenetrable uh, bureaucracy, uh, the, um, the instinct to cover up, um, to obfuscate, uh, to delay... Um, to uh, really put put people off inquiring because, um, frankly, you have to be pretty persistent to try and ask, uh, be, be fobbed off with as many bad answers as I've had in my, my parliamentary questions. So you've got to, there's got to be a stubborn streak. 
uh, in you. But I think that that is um, much more common in politicians than you might realise. OK, well, we need to stimulate that within our local MPs. I had a 20 minute conversation with my MP and asked for five, you know, the five series of data points I wanted to access. And, you know, he stated that he wouldn't be able to get access to this information. He'd come across the same roadblocks as you. And I, I felt my faith in democracy in that moment fade. Uh, but 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 it, it, it gave me a sense of tenacity and persistence, I suppose, that you've you've demonstrated to actually drive forward and actually help to create change, which, as we discussed prior to the, the interview, this is what Elevate is about. It's about driving positive change in the world and actually encouraging people to to take personal responsibility for the change they wish to see in the world. And to me, you're a great example of someone who's been doing this, certainly within the context of the vaccine damage bill and the work that you've been doing. So I want to thank you for your time with us today on the Elevate podcast. And I know on behalf of a lot of the people out there that have struggled and suffered, uh, there's an immense amount of gratitude uh, for the work that you're doing and the courage that you've, 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 you've demonstrated in taking this on. So thank you so much for, for being with us here today. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me and thank you for all your encouragement. Thank you for joining us for this important conversation with Sir Christopher Chope. There are many things that stand out for me from the conversation, namely the denial of the problem, and the gaslighting of the victims that have been suffering not only physically but emotionally, psychologically, financially throughout this period, but also the nature of the cover-up by the government, the MHRA and the uh, centralised bodies. We really must ask much deeper questions about how this has been allowed to happen, how uh, the denial has, has, has been so pervasive even across media uh, and start to address the systemic and fundamental issues that have been ar arisen as a result of not only this conversation but actually the whole uh, vaccine rollout itself. There are big, big questions that remain unanswered, and it's important that we continue to seek the facts. Now, here's where it gets really tricky. This particular conversation we anticipate will lead us receiving um, bans on social media, being censored. We're simply talking with a member of parliament who has a OBE, a distinguished career, who is taking upon a, 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 an official bill to address this issue. Yet, the social media platforms, the video channels, the platforms like YouTube do not allow this type of conversation. So it's vital that we continue to fight for free speech to enable these types of important conversations so that we can actually address the problems of our world uh, and not fall into a place where we cannot express ourselves about these important issues. In the interim, we encourage you to come and join us inside the Elevate Network. You can see us at weareelevate.org. It's our private online community where there are no algorithms and we get to determine what can be shown within our platforms where conversations like this are paramount. So please do join us inside of our community. We are exploring ways that we can support Sir Christopher Chope with this campaign and others. Uh, it's an important focus within the Elevate Network. So you can join us at weareelevate.org. I mentioned at the beginning of this interview that there are things that I would challenge Sir Christopher Chope on, and that remains to be true. And I'll be happy to have a conversation with him. Nonetheless, more importantly, I, I admire his valour in tackling this issue and his persistence in driving this bill forward. So I hope you'll join me in sending your encouragement and thoughts to Sir Christopher uh, Chope as he drives this forward. And uh, together we can help to bring about justice for those who have suffered and ask more important cutting questions and look for solutions that can prevent this from happening ever again. So this is the Elevate Podcast. My name is Dan Aston Gregory. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please help us to share this content. It's an incredibly important conversation and it's really important that those that suffered first and foremost get justice and then we seek about systemic change to make sure this never happens again. Thanks again. I look forward to seeing you on our next episode of the Elevate Podcast. Mm -hmm.